pen there so that we can get more indoor space to either do our The turntable will still move and it can't looks like under steam. You also have the rod connecting it to the piston up front. Now, up in the firebox here. What? <laughs> how you doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. I'm gonna sneak around here. You got your list and all that, huh? I don't need one. Do you have your list?
you have a steam engine. It needs to get turned around so it's facing forward to go out on its next run. Well, steam engines, especially the really big steam engines, they don't do corners real good. So, you either need to get a big loop of track, or you get yourself a turntable, which takes up a lot less space and was therefore a lot less, more common. Um, what happens is you'd bring your locomotive in, park it on the turntable, uh, the uh, turntable operator who would be in that uh, hut there, uh, he can then spin that turntable around whichever direction it needs to go. Either right around for it to get out on its next route, or you can start pointing it into one of the tracks here. Because steam engines almost always need a little bit of maintenance at the end of their run. That could be as simple as just checking to make sure oil levels are good, um, clean out the ash pit, something like that. Or it could be more major work. Maybe one of the air compressors wasn't working and so needs to be fixed before it can go back out. Um, so, you need a maintenance structure for steam locomotives. Well, the easiest thing to do is once you have a turntable, you make tracks that radiate away from the center of the turntable. Um, and you build a structure around it, hence you get a roundhouse. Uh, our roundhouse, when it was built in 1907, uh, originally had 10 stalls. And that goes from stall number one, which is this door with the blue stop crew at work sign on it, all the way to stall 10, which is over where that brick wall is still mostly standing. Um, later on, stalls 11 through 15, so five more slots were added. But then the diesels came. Diesels don't need the maintenance as much as steam engines do. Plus the US rail network was shrinking as a whole. So the railroad decided it didn't need the roundhouse anymore and so it started selling off bits and pieces. Unfortunately that's when stalls 11 to 15 were torn down. And while Midwest Railway got stalls 1 through 4 in the maintenance of uh, the machine shop, Another company got stalls 6 through 10. Uh, that cinder block wall was built down the middle of what used to be stall 5 to separate the two parts. Now, that company that owned stalls 6 through 10 had an incident with a backhoe that resulted in the roof partially collapsing. Uh, in the recent years, we've, after we got a hold of that part of the roundhouse as well, we've undertaken efforts to start to repair the roof over there and make more indoor space for us. Like I said, we have four stalls, two of them are leased out to outside groups, and so that leaves us only with two stalls, two slots, to do all of our indoor work, which is a lot, and usually that's not enough space. So one of our ongoing capital campaigns, uh, for those of you who feel like giving a few dollars, um, or, you know, anything up to, uh, we'll, we will take anything, a few dollars up to and including blank check. Uh, one of our uh, campaigns is to reboot, build the roof over stall 6 or 10 there so that we can get more indoor space to either do our own work or possibly additional space to lease out for other groups. <coughs> She looks like under steam, uh, in proper working order. Um, so, 4070 is um, was also built by Alco, that's the same company I mentioned built our diesel locomotive. Uh, she was built in December of 1918, uh, meaning she's just about to turn 100 here in a few more days. Um, she was built for the Grand uh, Trunk Western Railway. Uh, that originally ran in uh, Michigan and into Toledo and uh, Chicago. Uh, she is a 282 or Mikado type locomotive. And that operation up in Canada didn't work out, so she left one out to Tacoma, Washington, pulled trains out there for about three years, but that operation didn't work out either. So in 2008, she got pushed onto a siding and put in storage. She sat there for six years. 
2014, American Steam Railway Preservation Association, our group, signed a long-term lease with the owner. We got the locomotive back here to Cleveland, so we'll restore it for a back in operating condition, back to pulling trains and generating revenue to keep her sustained. That's the story of how 2100 wound up here in Cleveland. Women with rope pulling on level track for a publicity stunt. You can look that up on uh, the internet. <laughs> Pretty neat. Now they have to connect it to the first wheel and the third one, but you also have the rod connecting it to the piston up front. Okay, and I'm going to show you those rods in a minute. That's why this weight is so big. You have that extra rod hung there. 15,000 gallons of water. It's almost the length of this locomotive. This locomotive is 55 feet. The tender is about 45 feet. Anybody want to take a guess? How far 19 tons or uh, 26 tons of coal and 19,000 gallons of water will get us? 100 miles. Load of train. 100 miles. Uh, pretty close. He's at 100 miles, eh, maybe about 120. You'll get to Columbus. <laughs> Naturally, two people could not shovel 26 tons of coal in 120 miles. Okay, it wouldn't work. We have a big stoker or corkscrew mechanism that shoves the coal from the tender up into the firebox. And then we use five steam jets to blow it where it needs to go. That's how it's done. Okay? Every now and then you have to grab a shovel to get it back in the corners. For the most part, you're using steam jets and that big stoker to crush the coal and push it up in. Now, we have to check these rods every year to make sure they're not cracked. We do it with chemicals. Okay, That's one of the regulations we have to follow. Those are fine. We can reuse them again without any repairs, so we're good. That's dye penetrant? Oh, what's that? Dye penetrant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's why they have that whitish color to them right now. Yep. Now, the rods below are the big driving rods, okay? They are off the locomotive, these two big bottom rods, because these are bent. Okay, believe it or not, this locomotive bent those two rods, okay? Reading T1s were famous for bending and sometimes snapping one of these rods in half. That is how much thrust and power is coming out of those cylinders, okay? We will have them checked for cracks, x-ray, make sure they're okay and either straightened or off-bore the rod brasses a little bit to get everything lined up and true on the crank pins and wheels. We will let our professional contractor handle that work. They will tell us what needs to be done on those rods. Right. Now, up in the firebox here, right. a lot of people don't realize, but a firebox actually has an outer shell and an inner shell, okay? It's a double-walled firebox. The reason being is there's water between those two sheets to keep the metal cool enough because the fire is at 2,500 degrees. That is enough to melt the steel, okay? Now, every year we have to check and make sure that metal is still thick enough to withstand the 240 PSI pressure that this boiler is under. Please understand that this boiler holds about six to 8,000 gallons of water that's superheated at 400 degrees, ready to turn to steam like that. The minute you open the throttle, of course the steam goes to the cylinders and gets the train moving. That's how you want the steam to expand. <laughs> you don't want to ever have a failure in the pressure vessel itself. So every year we have to check the thickness of the metal in the firebox, and every 15 years or 1,472 days of operation, whichever comes first, have to check the entire boil. Okay? We will have to do that in about three years. We found the lower side sheets to be too thin. Okay? So our option was either derate the boiler to a lower pressure, we decided not to do that. We decided to put new side sheets in. Back to the thickness of metal they were originally designed or should have been, uh, were, were engineered for, which is 7 sixteenths. So this piece has been bent, it's been drilled, and in about a week and a half our contractors will be back and it'll be lifted up into the firebox, okay? And they'll be ready for mounting. Okay? So that's where we're at with this project. The other side, if you look up in there and take pictures, has already been done. It's temporarily mounted with bolts and tack welds, we are now ready to have the contractor come in once the funds are raised to do the full welding in that firebox. Okay. We're still raising about $36,000 for that project to be done. To pay for the welding, which is about five grand, and to buy 544 of these stables. These bolts fit into these sleeves, like so, okay. and then hold the two sheets from separating under pressure. So the one part of the sheet, which I just stuck that in, has the sleeve there and a socket so it can move a little bit. Because these sheets expand and contract at different rates. And this side is either threaded or welded. We'll weld the new ones in. The old ones were threaded. 
So then that way, there can be some movement in there so you don't have cracking. I'm exaggerating it, but that's how that works, okay? There's about 1,200 of these in the locomotive. To replace these shine sheets, we had to cut and destroy 544 of them, okay? 60 bucks a piece to replace them. Do the math. <laughs> If you wonder where the $36,000 number came from, that's about it right there, plus the welding. Once those funds are raised, we'll have everything set in the firebox and we can then pressure test the vessel. And when that passes, we can then go ahead and put steam to her. Okay? So we're only $36,000 away from pressure testing. And if that all passes, being able to then fire up the boiler. Now, we still have running gear work to do with the wheels, the rods, things like that. Or not the wheels so much, but the rods and things. <coughs> And our total projected uh, cost for everything, including the firebox, 255000 So that's what we're down to. A lot of people say, when will she run? We're about a year away if we can raise that 255000 That's where we're at. A little piece of Ohio history here. Can anybody read that word right there on that plate? Timken. You got it. It's one of the most Timken roller bearings on her. <laughs> on the back trailing truck and on the front wheel. The main driving wheels on this locomotive are still the plain bearing. They're not roller. The last 10 running T1s had roller bearings on them. Our tender is also fully roller bearing, but they bought their bearings there from SKF. <laughs> Go do, figure. do they still make <laughs> train bearings? We can still have bearings made if need be, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be done. Yeah, unfortunately, we just can't run and pull a part off the shelf like in the old days. <laughs> But many of the blueprints still exist for this locomotive. So, and that's something that uh, we do have to have Tim can take a look at one of the bearings, but the rest are in great shape. And then they'll guide us on what needs done with the other one, if anything, at this time. Well, once I found this one was back in Cleveland and it wasn't in too bad shape, I said, you know what, I'm 67, I better do something. <laughs> How you doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. I'm gonna sneak around here. Yeah, that's all right. Just watch your head. Oops. Oh. All right. <laughs> You're not gonna leave, are you? <laughs> oh, she wasn't with you guys. I just want to get a picture of Okay. I took this one, this last ran under coal, and that's the video you're watching down there, about 20 years ago in Denison, Ohio. Uh -huh. and they took it up to Canada and converted it to burn oil. Um, they took it out to Washington, they found out it didn't burn oil too well. Um, so we're converting it back to burn coal. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so a lot of the stuff that was in the cab has been taken out because it was set up to burn oil. All right. When we get done, it'll look like this. This is a picture of 2124, which is at Steamtown, which is about 99% complete. So anytime we have any questions, we, we have tons of photographs, and we can go out there and look at the darn thing in person if we if we need to. So when we get done, and hopefully that's going to be like a year to year and a half, assuming we get the money, um, it'll be back to burning coal. <clears throat> uh, the engine was built in 1923, was rebuilt as a, as a larger engine in 1945, uh, because they couldn't get diesels back then because the World War, World War II was going on, and all the diesel engines were being used by the Navy for the boats and the submarines and stuff. You're saying that there was diesel before the war? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, the diesel diesel engine probably was late 20s, early 30s. Um, some of the development actually was done here in Cleveland by the Winton Engine Winton, yeah, Company, yeah, yeah. which became Electromotive <laughs> Corporation, and then GM bought it and turned it into Electromotive Division. Um, the the Although there were uh, smaller diesels out, the first, the FTs, the first freight trains with the drawbars, um, which were sold as two and four unit sets, toured the country in 1939. Uh -huh. And those were about 1,200 horsepower, if you were lucky. How so much, so this, kind of this guy is about 3,800 How horsepower. much does this guy like this way? Lots. When it was working on. 800 tons. 800 tons. So what kind of controls do you Excuse have Excuse me, 400 just, tons, 800,000 yeah, pounds. I'm go sorry. Ahead with him. I'm have so to what go. kind of controls do you have here? I'm just looking oh, over. If, you were, if we were going to go here, okay, um, we'd have, obviously we'd have a tender behind us, and, and in the tender we would have coal and water. The water came on via hoses underneath, and okay. you could put water into the boiler um, when you were hot using this injector, or 
one of those knobs over there which which connected to the water pump over on the far side next to the window next to the window all right here yeah okay so that's how you got water into the boiler when it, when it was already hot um the coal would come in on a stoker screw the screw goes underneath here and there's a chute that comes up here and the steam jets would blow it into the firebox and, you'd, and then at firebox you'd probably want about um three or four inches of coal even you don't want too much coal you don't want not enough okay but about that much all right mm -hmm. so if we're if the fireman's got his fire in shape and is ready to go all right you release the brake two toots on the whistle you put this forward if we're going forward that's the brake this is the brake right here. Oh, that's the brake. What's this one here? Yeah, this is this is the injector. An injector. And this is the re what they call a reverser, or the Johnson bar. Okay. Okay. If we we're gonna go backwards, we would put it back like this. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go forward. We put this forward. We grab this. We pull it out a little bit, and we start to move. Okay. And then, as you got going, you would shorten the stroke up here because we don't need as much steam. Okay. Okay. We want to be fit, efficient, all right? And you pull the throttle out a little bit more. And they would, in the old movies, if you watch them, when a guy's going real fast, you'll see that this is standing almost straight up like that. Okay. Okay. Because he just needs a little bit of steam to keep him going. He's already moving. He just needs a little bit of steam to keep him going. You'd be, okay. You'd be surprised what you can do with a teaspoon of water. Wow. Okay. Um, so we would normally have half a glass of water in here. Okay. This would be water from this point below. From uh, above here would be steam. Um, and the steam would go two ways. It would go through the superheater uh, header and the throttle, uh, through the superheaters, and then go to the pist to, to the valves and the pistons to make everything move. The other a pipe would come back here and deliver steam to the appliances. So, like we have a steam-driven turbo generator, okay, that makes electricity for for the lights. It's, it's, um, you have you have lights here, so you can see your gauges. You know, you can see your water glass and stuff. That runs at about 32 volts DC. Um, and everything, the air pumps, everything on here is run by steam. If you don't have any steam, you're not going anywhere. Now, how do you know if you're low, running low on water? The glass. That, that's the glass. Yeah, okay. And there's two glasses on here. Now, do you have any additives that go in the water for like corrosion control or yes. anything like that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I used to do boiler treatments yeah. when I worked for Franklin Oil in Bedford. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you have to look for the calcium and magnesium um, for the uh, for the minerals. Um, you, so you put a treatment in for that, um, and you want to you want to leave it suspended so that it doesn't cake everything. Um, they put in a rust inhibitor because the water's in the tender. Okay. okay. And and even though you paint it and everything, you can pick up rust. Yes. And you also put in uh, uh, an inhibitor uh, to prevent oxygen pitting. Uh, because when you boil the water, um, you, you know, you're messing with the chemistry and you can actually have uh, create oxygen in there, which will start to pit the metal. Now, who's so, now who, once once you've got this rebuilt, who's going to do the recertification of the boiler itself? Is that like Hartford or TUV or any of those? Oh, we do it. We present, you do it. We present the facts to their inspector. They'll, they'll Eventually, someone will witness it from okay. the FRA or Hartford or any anyplace okay, else. Okay. Okay. Um, we have we have three consultants that we're working with that, that have worked on steam at the Western Maryland, okay. uh, the Everett Railroad, um, Ohio Central. And they've dealt with the FRA before, and that's why we're using them. Um, they're known quantities. They're not some Joe Blow that we got out of a phone book. <laughs> um, they're 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 experienced people, and and so if they tell the FRA something, the FRA you know knows that they can trust them good okay
this thing up in this room. It's, yeah. it's really cool. But... Santa Claus. How many more days to Christmas? How many more days to Christmas? You got your list and all that, huh? I don't need one. Do you have your list? I I need a list. I can't remember. Santa can't eat if you don't give me the list. The raffle for the Midnight Express guitar will be held at the open house on December 1st. Tickets are $25 each and they can be purchased online, in person at the Rand House on Monday through Saturday or at the next open house events which are Saturday November 24th and Saturday December 1st. The winner does not have to be present at the drawing. Santa will be visiting with our guests at the open houses. Please forward this information to your family and friends and share it on your social media sites. There are quite a few tickets left and all proceeds from the raffle will be used to fund more restoration work on stalls 6 through 10 of the roundhouse. Additional information is posted on our website under Midnight Express at midwestrailway.org or contact MRPS by phone at 216-781-36629 and leave it message.